Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Broadcom posts fourth quarter numbers that beat across the board as it tries to pull off the biggest takeover in tech history. Plus, Amazon and Alphabet butt heads over reciprocity with customers caught in the crossfire. We'll break down the stakes. And a Bloomberg exclusive Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong offers his take on Bitcoin, which just roared by $13,000. How the online platform has nearly tripled its user base since it picked up the cryptocurrency. But first, to our lead. Broadcom reports fourth quarter results beating forecasts and offering an optimistic outlook for the current quarter, indicating its smartphone customers are optimistic about demand. This on the backdrop of the company attempting to pull off the biggest tech deal ever, with its acquisition of Qualcomm. Let's bring in our Bloomberg editor-at-large, Corey Johnson. Corey, you've been pouring through the numbers. You sat down, you said it was a very interesting quarter. Why? Well, Broadcom's a really interesting business because they have gobbled up lots of different parts. You know, you mentioned Qualcomm as potential acquisition, but they've already gobbled up some really interesting and big parts of the semiconductor world. Uh, Avago buying Broadcom, uh, Avago having great success in the iPhone, Broadcom having success in the iPhone and in networking devices. Brocade, we were just talking about someone who worked at Brocade who got acquired by Broadcom. That company uh, also uh, dominant in the, in the storage business. But the results that we see here today from Broadcom, looking back into the quarter that ended in October, really strong iPhone business here. What we see here is really great strength in gathering more and more silicon in not this old iPhone, but in the new iPhones. And we see that business really showing up in these results. 17% year over year growth in the semiconductor space is very strong, very, very strong for businesses big. We've seen the danger of relying on Apple as a customer. How much does Broadcom rely on Apple as a customer as opposed to other it customers? It is absolutely the most important customer. And, and you know, looking forward to the Qualcomm M&A, Broadcom's been successful getting Apple to pay it. Qualcomm has been unsuccessful in getting Apple to pay it. Uh, Qual Qualcomm's been unsuccessful getting Apple to add more real estate in the phone. Uh, Broadcom has been able to add more real estate in the phone. Uh, interestingly, uh, you know, the quality of the phone calls that Apple likes to boast about, you remember how crummy the phone was when it first came out. And, I uh, not, it wasn't just that the service was bad, it was that actually hearing the calls was more and more difficult. Uh, Broadcom's got a great chip that helps, uh, it sits at the bottom of the radio chip and helps uh, understand, helps us to listen to a little bit better those signals that come in through the phone and l understand what we are saying to the phone. It helps power Siri. Uh, those kinds of chips are so important to Apple and they're relying on Broadcom. And you can see those sales in this quarter. But what we don't know about yet, and we're going to start to learn any second now as the conference call goes in, is how successful successful they've been uh, selling into routers selling into servers and selling, you know, think of the companies in technology that are really, really struggling now. Uh, Meg Whitman's Hewlett Packard uh, having horrible problems. Uh, a Cisco just barely coming out of a turnaround having trouble selling hardware. Oracle's Sun business struggling. Uh, uh, the IBM hardware business having a really hard time. Yet we see this growth in, in, in uh, Amazon Web Services, in Microsoft Azure, in Google's uh, uh, nascent efforts uh, in the cloud. Uh, what we see there is that they might be buying chips from Broadcom itself, not going to Hewlett Packard, not going to IBM to buy hardware, but buying the chips from Broadcom, building their own devices. That's what I want to hear about in the conference call that's going on right now is what kind of success are they having uh, selling into the white box manufacturers at Amazon, at uh, Microsoft, and at uh, Apple and at Facebook? What kind of update, if any, are we going to get on the progress of this potential takeover? Well, I think, you know, this is a, a lot of swimming upstream for Broadcom right here. I think the, uh, the thing that they could do to really help sway the market right now to convince them this deal is going to happen is to talk about financing and talk about how they can afford this. The financial guidance they just put out in this uh, in this earnings release. Again, the call is just beginning right now. The guidance is 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 nebulous. It's hey, in the future we're going to see margins go from 60 to 65 percent. We're going to see increased free, free cash flow as a percentage of net income. We're going to have a much financially stronger business going forward. They're not putting dates on it, but they're telling us that this business is going to get a lot of, go from really good to really great. I don't know if we believe them or not. They don't have a history of missing targets. Right, and it's more typical to have a time frame, right? Uh, it is typical of companies when they give very specific financial guidance to give us a, a time frame for that guidance, or at least a year out or two years out. They're saying eventually. But nonetheless, I think it's, it, it does suggest that they really see great things for this business and, and would give them the kind of financial leverage to uh, do an acquisition and borrow a lot of money to do so. All right. Well, I know you're going to be listening into the call. Thank you so yep. much. Uh, we will share updates as we have them. Our editor-at-large, Corey John. Johnson will continue to monitor the Broadcom earnings call and we will bring you any headlines.
All right, coming up, the feud between two tech giants heats up. Why Google dropped YouTube from Amazon's devices and what it means for users next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. A new study shows just how far Silicon Valley still has to go to fight sexual harassment and improve workplace diversity. A study by venture firm First Round Capital found 53% of respondents experienced or personally know someone who was sexually harassed in the workplace. And when it comes to diversity, just 17% of startups have a formal strategy to promote diversity and inclusion. That's up only slightly from 14% in 2016. Amazon and Alphabet are getting aggressive in order to gain a greater hold in the competitive smart speaker market. Google dropped its YouTube video service from Amazon devices, citing the internet retailer's failure to make Amazon Prime Video available through Google's gadgets, as well as the recent halt of the sale of some Nest products on the Amazon website. So who has the upper hand and what does it mean for consumers? Let's bring in James Chalkmock, analyst at Monas Crespi and Hart, who covers these firms. And in New York, we've got Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman. So Mark, what happened here? To be honest with you, it's, it's a very petty fight that we're seeing between two companies, and it comes down to them both being strong competitors to each other, right? Amazon is making hardware now, Google's making hardware now. Amazon came out with Alexa, Google now has Google Assistant. Amazon has their video service and music service, Google has uh, their music service now. So what, what's going on here? Well, the YouTube application on the Echo Show, this is Amazon's new popular speaker uh, that has a touch screen for watching video and, and voice commands and such no longer has a functioning YouTube application. The Fire TV, the set-top box that people can use to connect Amazon services to their big screens at home, it won't have YouTube support beginning January 1st. Google, uh, excuse me, Amazon says Google, James, is setting a dangerous precedent. What do you think? I mean, look, I think petty is the right word for what we're seeing now, but I mean, these two companies are on a complete collision course, right? If you think about all the areas that they're competing, you know, it's the advertising dollars that are starting to flow from Google over to Amazon, the Internet of Things with the smart speaker market. And then on top of that, you have the whole content endeavor. I think that what you're going to see from Amazon is potentially a subscription like YouTube TV type offering. So I think that these companies collision course <laughs> is the destination. So Mark, why aren't Amazon's videos available on Google devices? This as Amazon and Apple are deepening their partnership and you can get Amazon Prime Video on Apple TV. From a business perspective, at, le at least to me, it actually makes very little sense. What companies should be doing, and Microsoft is a very good example of this, is putting their subscription services on as many platforms as possible. So that means they have so much of a user base, as many people as possible, to subscribe to their services. All Amazon is doing here by limiting uh, their the, uh, Google's ability to have the Amazon Prime Video service on Google devices is having a less amount of people to subscribe to it. So in the end, they could be losing money here. But on the other side, it's, it's a power move. It's a move they want leverage for certain things. Google's upset that Amazon doesn't sell the latest products on Amazon.com, the retail website. And Amazon is upset at Google because they're going on their turf. They have an Alexa competitor now as well. So, James, they're both being mm -hmm. petty. It doesn't it appear that way? Yeah, I mean, it's petty, <laughs> but, but the thing is, this is part of a much bigger fear that I think both companies have. And I think b between the two, it's advantage Amazon because all of those ad dollars that are at risk for Google are starting to flow over. The, the primary component for Google that's been a big driver is the product listing ads. You don't need those as much anymore if you go to Amazon. And then if you think about the content side with the disproportionate amount of spending that Amazon's doing with their prime video versus Google, um, I think you're going to see bigger and bigger moves 
moves on their part, which puts YouTube at risk. So you have a lot of risks that Google's facing. Uh, so I don't really blame either company for trying to jockey uh, until we see where the chips kind of fall. Mark, would you agree it's advantage Amazon? Yeah, I mean, I think Google's coming from the from the you know below approach here. They're sort of punching up because Google has this strong infrastructure. They're the ones that are making so much money in the ad business. They're they're really I can see their perspective though because what Amazon did is they created YouTube applications on themselves. They did, they're not using Google made YouTube apps like other companies do. Like on the iPhone, Apple worked with Google to make a Google optimized YouTube app, which allows YouTube to get their ad dollars. Perhaps the Amazon approach uh, makes sure that Google. Google doesn't get as much ad revenue as they normally would have gotten on an in-house YouTube application. So I could see why Google would be upset. But either way, the thing to know here for those watching is that the only people really losing here are you, the, the, the customer. What's happening when it comes to the battle for the home? If you're an Apple household or a primarily Android household, are these devices then able to communicate with each other? You throw an Amazon Alexa into the mix. How do you in the household reconcile these different devices? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked. We actually had a Gadgets with German episode earlier today, and I encourage everyone to watch on Facebook.com slash Gadgets with German, comparing all the latest smart speakers. We had the new Echoes, we had the new Microsoft speaker, and the Sonos One. My takeaway from this was that the Sonos One, it works with both Alexa and Google Assistant starting next year, as well as some of the Apple protocols for streaming music. The Microsoft One is its, in its own world, but the Echoes, I think, are the best overall. They can work with your Apple devices. They can sync to your Apple iCloud calendar. They can work with your Android phone and obviously with your Microsoft email account as well. So I think today, as of today, the Alexa, the Echo ecosystem, and the Sonos One together, those will work with most people's homes if you're in a divided iOS versus Android household. But also, Google has their Google optimized speakers, right, with the Google Home Max coming out next week, the Google Home Mini, and they have uh, more Google Home products in the pipeline. And Apple has their, their HomePod coming out uh, in early 2018, so anytime between January and April. And that's going to be very much optimized to the iPhone, and it's not going to really work for someone uh, who uses a non-Apple uh, iPhone as their core of their ecosystem. James, how do you expect this to play out within the home and impact sales and the bottom line? I, mean, I think it's again advantage Amazon because they're doing two things. One of the first things that they're doing is uh, they're starting to really educate the users by they have these whole teams where they help you go and actually build your smart home. And the second thing that they're doing is they completely understand what they are and what they aren't and they're uh, by looking to partner with all the major companies that will help the Echo and the Alexa ecosystem really be successful because they're not going to be trying to be everything to everyone and go outside of their skill sets. And I think that platform approach that they're doing, integrating all these third-party services. You saw it with the, the cars and the Ford, BMW, and I think you're going to see a lot more partnership announcements to come. And I think if they can push the customer uh, and educate them, I think then that ecosystem will be built around uh, what Amazon has uh, set. Okay, James Schockmach of Monas Crespi and Hart. Thank you, as well as Mark Gurman, Bloomberg Tech and host of Gadgets with Gurman, which <laughs> you definitely should watch. Uh, thank you both. Coming up, Airbnb wants to be the top destination for sustainable travel. We will sit down with a top exec and hear their strategy. That's next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. WeWork doesn't look to be scared of any potential downturns from Brexit. The office-sharing startup is set to become London's largest private renter of offices. This according to data compiled by CoStar for Bloomberg. WeWork currently operates 17 London facilities. Two more will open soon, and it's announced expansion plans at 10 additional locations there. It's also in talks to buy a 12-building campus near Liverpool Street Station for $800 million. Well, the United Nations designated 2017 as the International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development, and Airbnb is using the UN's guidelines to showcase its potential as a top sustainable option. We sat down with Chris Lehane, who heads Airbnb's global policy and public affairs. We began by looking at the company's growth. What's really, really interesting is we're seeing major travel in what has traditionally been called the flyover areas and also in emerging economies. But you look at our recent report, it shows almost over 250% growth in places like Indianapolis, Indiana. And I think what that really speaks to 
it's a network effect of the platform as it spreads out and more and more people use it. But those are also places that have traditionally been a little bit underserved in terms of the traditional accommodation options. Hard for those hotels to justify build out there. And when you have things like the Indianapolis 500 or Big Ten football, the Big Ten football championship was in Indy last week. You, know, you see our platform just sort of spring to life. You're also expanding in Asia, in Africa, in the Pacific. Yeah. What's been the biggest challenge? I think, you know, for us, it's just, you know, the pace of the growth, right? I mean, that's, that's a high-class challenge, by the way. I and mean, we just had our best quarter we've ever had, over 260 million people now on the platform. Um, but, you know, this growth is just taking place underneath us. And for us, it's, you know, incredibly important that we make sure, you know, it's working as well as possible for our guests and our hosts, because ultimately, over 60% of the people who use Airbnb do so based on the recommendation of a friend our family member, and I just came back from Jamaica, tough travel, I realize, but it was the, the UN had a conference on inclusive travel, how you can use travel as it becomes a bigger and bigger part of the global economy, 10% and growing pretty fast. How can you make sure that everyone is benefiting from it? Um, and from a sustainability perspective and from an economic inequality perspective. And so a big part of what we talked about was by 2030, almost 60% of all travel is gonna be taking place in these emerging markets. And how can we begin to do things now to make sure that entire communities are benefiting from it? And I think folks see us given that we're making travel available and accessible to traditionally non-traditional areas where people travel to um, as part of that solution. So it was really exciting, but it's an interesting thing to be having a conversation with right now at the front end of this whole trend. You say you're focusing on sustainable tourism. What does that mean? How do you do that? Does it mean you don't put certain listings on your platform? Great question. So if you look at our the way our platform works, it has uh, roughly a 65% less impact on carbon than a traditional hotel. I mean, one of the greatest contrib contributors to climate challenges is cement. Mm -hmm. It takes an enormous amount of cement to build, you know, traditional hotels. Um, and so, you know, our places are already built. They're places where people live. Also, about 90% of them are in non-traditional hotel districts. Um, so people can actually travel there and get around by foot, get around by bike. Um, less water impact, less energy impact. Uh, and what you see from our survey data is that over 70% choose to use Airbnb because they see it as a sustainable option when it comes to travel. And in a time period when climates can begin to become, it's one of the huge issues of our time, obviously. Um, and with travel and tourism growing so fast, how can you make sure you're doing it in a sustainable way? Any insight into whether Trump's policies on immigration is impacting international tourism? It's a great question. Um, I will say we haven't seen that yet. Now, you know, we've been out front in terms of opposing uh, the travel ban. Um, we actually had a whole campaign called We Accept, uh, which was really built around that. We haven't seen that in terms of actual travel and tourism. I do think it has profound impacts on, on the U.S. And I think where you potentially see that is, you know, does the U.S. brand, you know, as the home of the Statue of Liberty, right, does that take a hit as a result of that and then as, as a derivative of that, uh, you know, travel and tourism? I think it's growing so fast. I'm not sure that's going to be the case. But you do see the reverse of it in the following way, which is when I was in Jamaica, I had a number of countries that came up and wanted to talk to us about how we could work with them to make our data accessible, anonymized, to help inform their marketing because they themselves are actually looking to diversify their travel, where they're inbound, where people are traveling from to go visit their countries. And they specifically were concerned about becoming overly dependent on the U.S for travelers and wanting to diversify. And I think that is really being driven by some concerns about issues that are taking place over here in terms of how welcoming the U.S. is perceived to be. You worked in the Clinton administration. <laughs> I'm an old guy. <laughs> we recently covered uh, sexual misconduct of Shervin Pishavar, an investor at Airbnb, mm -hmm. also a major Democratic Party donor, did yeah. give money to Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. What's your response to these allegations? I think we believe what the women have said out there. Um, I think we've gone through a, and I think it's been a long time coming, and it was very much needed, you know, a pretty significant transition in the world, uh, particularly in this country, uh, in terms of people being willing to speak up and stand up uh, on an issue that's been taking place for, for forever. Um, and I just, I mean, every day you read these stories, and I just, incredibly impacted by the courage of some of these victims, these women, to stand up and, and talk about these these issues. Uh, and so obviously, you know, it's not particularly hard to say. We condemn any of that type of activity. I certainly uh, believe what, what the women are saying out there, but I think, you know, even more broadly, you know, do see that we're now in the middle of a pretty significant transition 
um, in what social mores are and how people look at these and how people accept it, um, how the press covers it, um, how willing people are to talk about it uh, and engage on it. Um, and that's incredibly important if we're actually going to be able to address the underlying substantive challenges. Airbnb had its own sexual misconduct situation in China. The head of Airbnb China left, as we understand it. He had an relationship with a subordinate. What actually happened there? Well, I think as you could probably guess, um, you know, we just don't talk about HR types of issues, mm -hmm. personnel types of issues. I would say that, you know, we are generally speaking, broadly speaking, and we're not always perfect. We don't get everything exactly right, um, you know, but we certainly do have a value system that we believe in strongly um, and, uh, and seek to execute and act against those values. Reporters are speculating that Airbnb will go public in 2018. You never what asked this question. I'm, so, I'm just absolutely shocked that you I would know ask that shocker. question. <laughs> I told you, when we know, you'll know. Chris Lahane there, head of Airbnb's Global Policy and Public Affairs. Coming up, just days away from its CBOE debut, Bitcoin hits the $13,000 mark. How Bitcoin futures could impact the online trading platform Coinbase. Next. And a feature I want to bring to your attention, our interactive TV function. Find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You can watch us live. If you miss an interview, you can go back to it. You can send our producers a message, play along with the charts we bring you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. I'm Jessica Summers in New York, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. Reaction from the Middle East to the United Nations has been swift following President Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called it, quote, an historic day. This decision reflects the president's commitment to an ancient but enduring truth, to fulfilling his promises, and to advancing peace. The president's decision is an important step towards peace. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas says the decision ends the U.S.'s role in the Middle East peace process. President Trump is also making waves elsewhere in the Middle East. In a statement today, the president called on Saudi Arabia to end its Yemen blockade immediately, citing humanitarian concerns. Trump said he directed administration officials to reach out to Saudi leaders to ensure that food, fuel, water and medicine reach the Yemeni people. Medical testing has revealed brain abnormalities in victims of so-called invisible attacks on the U.S. embassy in Cuba. The AP says the findings cast doubt on whether a sonic weapon was used on American workers. The U.S. says 24 officials and their spouses fell ill after mysterious sounds led to hearing loss. And as political decisions go, this one isn't much of a shock. Russia's President Vladimir Putin has announced he will run for a fourth term in March. That ends months of speculation over what he would do next. With approval ratings topping 80 percent, Putin is a heavy favorite to win a new six-year term. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Jessica Summers. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. here in New York, 6.30 Thursday morning in Hong Kong. I'm joined by Bloomberg's Sophie Cameroon with a look at the market. Sophie, good morning. Good morning, Jessica. Asian stocks are set to stem losses after a rough patch midweek. Emerging markets, uh, they're particularly looking at like a nasty slump, sinking to a two-month low with China front and center. Now, the woes of the tech-heavy EM index, those have been compounded by the drag in commodities. Oil continuing to slide in the face of a gasoline buildup. But with global stock declines pausing in the U.S. and the dollar climbing, that's painting a slightly better picture for Japanese futures. Flipping the board, you're going to see that the Nikkei 225 could could recover some of this worst slide in nine months. But now we are seeing futures slide by 1% in Japan. But Aussie futures, they are pointing higher ahead of the latest trade balance figures. In Hong Kong, I'm Sophie Kamarudin. Up next, more with Bloomberg Technology.
for technology, I'm Emily Chang. Bitcoin soars past $13,000 for the first time. The largest cryptocurrency by market value was selling for less than $1,000 at the start of the year. In recent days, several exchanges have come out with news on offering Bitcoin futures. Joining us now, Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong. Coinbase is an online platform that allows users to buy or sell Bitcoin by connecting with their bank accounts. It has almost tripled its user base this last year, now standing at 13 million. So a wild ride, especially in the last few weeks. What do you see happening with this surge? Where is it going? Mm. Well, there's certainly been this big influx of new interest in digital currency. Part of that has been driven by institutional money uh, getting really interested in the space. So we've seen uh, most of the large derivatives exchanges out there, CME, a number of others, starting to say they're going to list Bitcoin futures. And so um, that's driven a lot of interest. It's a big signal that traditional financial institutions are now starting to move into digital currency. What is the CBOE, CME, NASDAQ, them trading these contracts? What does that mean for you? Does that create new challenges? Well, number one, it's just a big endorsement of the digital currency space as this is a real asset class that more and more players are going to trade. But I think for us specifically, what it means is that um, we offer spot market data to a number of these providers or we're discussing it with them. Uh, we run the largest institutional exchange in the United States called GDAX for digital currency. Um, the other thing is that we are offering a custodian product where a lot of institutional investors need a secure way to store digital currency on behalf of their LPs and their clients. And so uh, we launched a uh, product recently on that for Coinbase custody. So those are the ways that it might influence our business. Are you at all worried, though, that your clients might decide to go work with traditional mainstream Wall Street companies <laughs> rather than Coinbase? Well, I mean, I think it's certainly an option. Like, there's going to be more and more people involved in the digital currency space. Like, we're not going to be the only ones. And so I think that's a good thing. Like, there's just going to be a diversity of players out there. There's going to be a lot of winners. But digital currency is moving so fast that I do think a company dedicated to it with 200 people who've built up this industry knowledge over the last five years is going to have a sustainable competitive advantage. Now, we have to talk about customer service. You've been experiencing a glitch, as you have with prior surges why does this happen? Yeah, well, I mean, it's in a word, it's hyper growth, right? Uh, we've hired from about 40 customer support agents to about uh, 220 or so this year. And I think by the end of next year, we'll have another 400 or so. And so we're in addition to the 200 that you already have. Yeah. So and we also launched phone support this year. So we are going through this period of growth that is almost never seen in business. Um, you know, it's really difficult, to be honest, to keep up with uh, this amount of demand. And I, we're not servicing our customers to the level that they deserve at the moment. Um, so that's really frustrating to see. But it's my job from the top to ensure that we're going to get there. But can you explain a little bit more about why it happens? Like, is it a glitch? Yeah. Is it a crash? What's actually happening technically? Oh, no. I mean, it's just a huge influx of new customers. Um, so, you know, our volumes, whether you look at it as uh, trading volume, new signups, everything, it's gone about 8x since June of this year, um, which is just unheard of. So it's really difficult to plan for that kind of capacity. So it's literally that you don't have enough humans behind the scenes to receive all of these complaints? Correct. So, you know, in addition to hiring new people, is there anything else that you can do? Mm, I mean, certainly we can always improve the product, right? I mean, improving the product is a way to reduce the number of customer support tickets that are coming inbound. So, you know, the team is working really hard on that. I, the kind of key metrics we look at are around, you know, uptime, NPS score, average time to customer response. Those are the core metrics we're looking at to ensure that we're meeting our customer uh, demands at this time. Do you have any concerns that this will decrease trust among your customers? Is that new customers, you'll lose new customers as a result of this? Um, you know, honestly, I do have that fear, yeah. I think that it's really difficult to go through a period of this rapid growth and maintain the same level of service. Um, and we've been watching those metrics, and, and they're not where we want them to be. So, um, you know, growth is a really high quality problem to have, but it doesn't mean it's not a big problem. And I think especially in financial services, we're held to a much higher bar than, say, like the Twitter fail will or something like that. I mean, we're storing people's money, and I think people are right to call us to a higher standard. The IRS has been asking for more information about your holdings and your profits. What are you hearing from your clients about mm. this? 
Yeah, well, the IRS sent us a subpoena for a large number of customer records, in fact, all customer records, um, over a several year period, which was pretty unprecedented. And so we did push back on that really strongly. We, we took it to court. Um, the, the judge, uh, you know, I think gave us a big vote of confidence and they reduced the scope of the, the IRS request by 97%. It wasn't down to zero, which is where we think it should have been for something that broad, but it was certainly a partial victory. Now, I think if you look long term, um, look, we want to help people pay all their taxes on digital currency gains. Th what I think this should look like is something kind of like Fidelity or Charles Schwab, where everybody gets 1099 statements, you get, the IRS gets a copy, our customers get a copy. It should be that simple. Um, we're working with the IRS now, thankfully, to make sure that we come up with some kind of a solution where everyone's going to pay their taxes. But um, this is one of those new areas. Technology keeps finding a new box that doesn't fit into the existing framework quite perfectly. And we need to work with everybody out there to make sure we get there. Given the uncertainty currently, as you work this out, are you giving any advice to your clients about how to report their gains to the IRS? So, you know, obviously we try to stay away from any sort of tax advice um, since that's not what we do. Um, but we do provide a report to our customers, a cost basis report that they can export and send to their accountant. So that's the solution we have in the interim until there's something like 1099s or, or 1099s themselves. Let's talk about what's happening with some of these other cryptocurrencies, Ethereum and Litecoin, you can trade on Coinbase. What do you see happening with Ethereum versus Bitcoin in the future? Mm. Well, they've sort of evolved down different paths. Um, you know, Bitcoin used to be 95% of all the market cap of digital currency, and it's come down quite a bit. I think something maybe to 50 or 60%. And so uh, Bitcoin is ending up, in my mind, being a little bit more like digital gold, if you will. It's, it's kind of the oldest digital currency. It's, a time, it's the one that people, people flee to in times of uncertainty. But it hasn't scaled to become, for example, a payment network with the sort of transaction throughput that people might want. So um, Ethereum has kind of grown to do that. And Ethereum is now doing more transactions per day than Bitcoin. Um, Ethereum also has this really innovative new concept of smart contracts. And so it's much more programmable than Bitcoin. Bitcoin you could think of as a simple four function calculator. You can send A to B or subtract B to A. Um, Ethereum is almost like a, a programming language where you could write any software and run it on this globally decentralized computer. So that's kind of a mind-bending concept, but um, let's just say that Ethereum is higher throughput per second as a transaction network, and it's much more programmable. You have launched a new app called Toshi, which yeah. seems sort of like an app store for Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Explain what you're trying to do here. Yeah. Well, the analogy I like to use is of the internet. So when the internet started, you had TCP IP and Usenet, and it was really difficult to use. And then a browser came out on top of the internet with Netscape, and it made it easy for anybody to build an app and also uh, access the internet. So we're doing the same thing with Toshi. Toshi, as you can think of it as a browser for the Ethereum network. Um, and we're trying to make it really easy for any developer to build an app and any consumer to actually use applications on the Ethereum network. And honestly, we're a little bit inspired by things like WeChat and in India, or sorry, in China and Paytm in India, uh, even M-Pesa in Kenya. Like mobile money is a really big deal, especially outside the United States. And I think that people in emerging markets could actually use digital currency to start to get access to financial services through something like Toshi. So when it comes to the price, how do you see Bitcoin versus Ethereum playing out? I mean, do you, A, do you see the Bitcoin spike continuing? Do you see Ethereum surpassing Bitcoin as some have suggested it will? Yeah. Well, of course, I never want to be giving any investment advice, but I mean, just in broad strokes, the way I think of it is that um, Bitcoin does have a certain amount of guaranteed scarcity built in. There's only ever going to be 21 million coins. And if, of course, if something's more scarce, the price can be driven up. Mm -hmm. um, Ethereum has taken a, a different approach, which is that there may be a moderate inflation curve, almost like the US dollar, if they might target 2 to 3% inflation a year. They're actually still deciding exactly what it's going to be. So it's not Ethereum is not trying to be gold, which is what Bitcoin is. It's trying to be something more like um, a payment network or something more programmable. So that all factors into what the price will be. I guess one other really broad thing you could look at is just where are the users going? You know, and where are the developers building the new apps? I personally see more developers building apps on top of Ethereum today. Um, so that's one other factor which could point to what it might be in the future. We talk about this a lot on Bloomberg, whether, you know, is Bitcoin a fraud? Is it not? Are we in a bubble? Are we not? If it's not a fraud, is it a bubble? What do you think? <laughs> 
Well, I mean, I certainly don't think it's a fraud. I mean, um, if, is it a bubble? Maybe. I mean, digital currency has gone through a number of these periods where there's a big run up and then it'll correct back. But you're at a new plateau each time it goes up and it kind of comes back a little bit. So I think we're going through the most recent run up period. It's probably the fourth one we've been through as a company. Um, and I would expect it to correct back at some point, but continue over time in an upward channel. There's an update to the Bitcoin network called SegWit, which would speed up transactions. You guys haven't implemented that yet. Do you plan to and when? Um, yeah, it is one of the things we're looking at adding. Um, it's probably not in the top five next things that our customers are requesting. What but are the top five next things? <laughs> people want uh, more assets on the platform. They want a better uh, experience, meaning like identity verification, higher limits, um, the sign up onboarding experience. And then they're asking for these new products, uh, like our institutional customers are asking for a custodian product. Um, you know, people are looking at a way to just trade more assets, have a better experience, and store it securely. All right, Brian Armstrong, CEO of Coinbase. Thanks so much yeah, for stopping by. Yeah, thanks for having by. me. We'll be watching. All right, Google won dismissal of a California class action lawsuit alleging the company systematically paid male employees more than females. San Francisco Superior Court Judge Mary Wiss wrote, this class action, this class definition does not purport to distinguish between female employees who may have had valid claims against Google based upon its alleged conduct from those who do not. She allowed the women to file an amended complaint. The new complaint will make clear that Google violates the California Equal Pay Act by paying women less than men for substantially equal work. Coming up, more on Broadcom's fourth quarter results. Here's what CEO Hawk Tan just said on the investor call. We closed our fiscal 2017 on a very strong note with solid financial results for the fourth fiscal quarter. Oh, more details from the call ahead. This is Bloomberg. Disney CEO Bob Iger will likely extend his tenure at the company past 2019. This according to Dow Jones, which says the extension is to help facilitate the potential sale of 21st Century Fox assets to Disney. Iger had planned to step down in July of 2019 after Disney's board of directors extended his contract last March. And now back to our top story, Broadcom's fourth quarter results. The chip maker beat forecasts and has its investor call going on right now. We are continuing to monitor this call. To talk about it more, I want to bring in our Bloomberg Tech reporter, Alex Barinka, who covers deals for us. So, Alex, what have they said so far about this Qualcomm potential takeover. The biggest potential tech takeover ever. CFO Tom Krause, Broadcom CFO, did come on and give some clarity, uh, a bit of clarity as to what they're thinking about this deal. Uh, they did say, he did say that if uh, a preliminary agreement were to be, a definitive agreement were to be signed, they expect this deal would go through in about 12 months, which is a new detail here in terms of their expected timing. The other thing that I uh, would bring up right off the bat is the fact that they have had initial meetings with certain relevant antitrust authorities, the CFO said, and they think that a regulatory requirement necessary to complete the accommodation would be met in a timely manner. I bring this up because this regulatory uh, issue is key to Qualcomm's defense in, in kind of beating back Broadcom from this major takeover. So the fact that they're giving some kind of clarity on the Broadcom side that they think that something could get done is a bit of an inch forward in terms of uh, going the back and forth between these two companies. I will say that the CFO did continue to come out and say we they want to have a constructive dialogue with Qualcomm right now. Uh, as of this week, they introduced, Broadcom introduced a new board slate for Qualcomm, uh, encouraging Qualcomm shareholders to vote for their new board at the March board meeting and progress this deal along. But right now, it still seems like Qualcomm is saying the $105 billion offer price that 
Broadcom is looking to take over this company at is still too low and undervalues this company. Unfortunately, uh, shareholders won't get a lot more clarity in the course of this call. Emily, I was listening to it up until uh, I went on here with you, and the CFO told analysts, please do not ask any more questions about the deal. We won't be talking about it any further. Um, but, you know, he did say we've received positive feedback from shareholders and customers about the potential transaction. So that seems to be uh, the best we're going to get at this point, even though there are still a lot of unanswered questions from the broad com side that the market is definitely still looking for. The CFO did ask analysts to please focus on the financial results, which uh, Corey Johnson reported on earlier, uh, saying that it was an interesting quarter and a strong quarter. We all remember that photograph of Hock Tan, the CEO of Broadcom, with President Trump. What kind of dialogue do you imagine is happening behind the scenes, given the challenge that the DOJ is posing to the AT&T Time Warner deal? You'll remember that photo happened the day before Bloomberg broke the news on this deal that Broadcom was preparing an offer for Qualcomm. So so they, he did, the CFO did speak very uh, quickly about the redomiciling, which is, is the move that was talked about in this meeting with Trump, that they're moving uh, headquarters over here to the U.S. So when it comes to uh, these regulatory concerns, the cross-border deals, the non-U.S. companies buying U.S. tech companies, those kind of deals will take longer to work their way through the regulatory system if history is any guide. So the fact that Broadcom will now have its HQ here in the States, uh, uh, potentially uh, will help ease some of the at least optics concerns. But if you look at what's going on with Qualcomm, remember Qualcomm's still trying to acquire NXP. That deal has been caught up in the regulatory quagmire for about 14 months. We're still waiting to hear uh, what happens with that deal. So reg and what happens with regulatory approvals is top of mind and again that's why the fact that Broadcom CFO came out today saying they've had initial conversations and they think a timely manner uh, would be the case if this deal were to go through with Broadcom and Qualcomm is a very important thing that I think the market will fixate on uh, into the coming weeks. Whew, so much action in the chip space. Thanks so much Alex Barinka, our tech deals reporter in New York. Now, Steve Mollenkopf, Qualcomm CEO, will be speaking at the Economic Club in D.C. tomorrow. We're going to be monitoring remarks, his remarks, and we will bring you the latest as we have them. Still ahead, Apple CEO Tim Cook says he couldn't be happier with iPhone 10 sales in China. We'll head to Guangzhou to hear from him next. This is Bloomberg. The annual Fortune Global Forum is underway in Guangzhou, China. And top tech execs like Alibaba's Jack Ma and Apple's Tim Cook are using the opportunity to tout the importance of open trade between the U.S. and China. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie attended and filed this report. Apple CEO Tim Cook stealing some of the limelight at the Fortune Global Forum today, talking about his views on the Chinese market, saying that one of the attractions for him was the quality of the people here and also the partnership that Tencent and Apple have together. He also was asked about iPhone X sales here in the Chinese market and said he was very positive about the momentum he was seeing there. If you look at how iPhone 10 is doing here, I could not be happier. Um, we had a few quarters of negative growth on a year-over-year -year basis. We returned to double-digit growth last quarter, uh, even before the iPhone 10 ship. We also heard from the chairman of Ford, Bill Ford, saying that China was taking a leading role in the development of electric vehicles, saying that he was very confident about the growth opportunities there. And we heard from the founder of Tencent, a company that's now got a market cap of well over 400 billion US dollars, Pony Ma, talking about the competition between Tencent and Alibaba in at least a dozen different sectors, and also talking about what he sees as significant multi-billion dollar opportunities in the healthcare and education sectors here in China. 
I believe China's education sector will grow to become a market that's worth hundreds of billions of dollars, and the healthcare sector here will be even bigger in size. Now, both industries are still in their early stage, and our strategy is to make a bet on all horses. Alibaba founder Jack Ma also took to the stage and said we shouldn't be worried about automation and AI, saying that humans would be controlling robots, not the other way around. He also made an overtly political statement, saying that one of the reasons he is fundamentally bullish on the outlook for the Chinese economy is because of the one-party system here. And he took a swipe at the divisions between the Republicans and the Democrats in the U.S. Tom McKenzie, Bloomberg, Guangzhou. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder, we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.